we get, off, we get to kick off this thought uh, called, Are You Drifting or Are You Drafting? Um, how I'm going to do this is I'm going to ask for 25 minutes, if that's okay. I know you gave me 40, um, and I'm going to see how far I get, all right? And then we'll finish up the rest of it next week, because I trust the Word of God will minister to you right where you are. Are you drifting or are you drafting? So often, we think that small things don't matter. We brush it off as an uncommon occurrence or an unrepeatable reality. The truth is, everything I do today produces what I experience tomorrow. The further truth is, everything you do today produces what you experience tomorrow. The Church of Hebrews, for which we're going to be diving into over the next few weeks, was going through some difficult times. Most of them were former Jews who became Christians. They left the empty rituals and converted to Christianity, realizing that all of the rituals actually pointed to Jesus Christ. Now they are ready to rock and roll with destiny and purpose. However, there was a great persecution that was happening to the church of Hebrews, which is not written by Paul, but it is an unidentified pastor of this church who gives us some very powerful uh, relatability. Because he lets us know you don't have to be a super apostle or a great prophet to have prominence in the kingdom of God. See, in this particular church, because of the persecution that had happened, their joy waned and their hope was diminishing. Many over time began to think that the choice to follow Jesus Christ was the wrong choice. The persecution caused them to slowly lose heart and lose connection. Honestly, drifting, if I would say to you, is rarely intentional. No one sets out to drift in life or in their journey with God. Yet through a series of small decisions, one sets the course of drifting. It's much like falling out of love. No couple wakes up in the, uh, one day and just simply says, I don't love you no more. <clears throat> there are decisions, argument after argument after argument after unresolved argument, leads to silence, leads to bitterness, leads to resentment, which causes the mind to create narratives about the other person. They start getting distant and more distant and distance demonizes. And before you know it, they think each other are the enemy because of decisions to take each other for granted. Drifting is set in place because you're so busy wanting to win that you lose the relationship. You see, I want to just share with you all, when a person goes to divorce court, that doesn't finalize the divorce. The divorce been finalized. It's just legal now because divorce doesn't happen overnight. There are a series of things that happen when we take each other for granted, when we allow unresolved conflict to stay unresolved, when we allow the beating of each other because there is a trust and there's an access to each other's privacy that we take for granted and we keep badgering each other and bludgeoning each other, we get surprised when the result is separation. The same goes for many of you who are here today. Your relationship with God doesn't drift in one statement. It's, it's a series of decisions. It's one thing after another. It's one thing after another. It's one slight directive that God isn't in. And then you start building up a snowball momentum where first it used to be faithfulness to ministry, faithfulness to church. And slowly but surely, you begin to ratchet down your faithfulness to allow other things occupy that space and before you know it you don't have the appetite for worship yeah. today my brothers and sisters I want to share with you all a little bit about drifting its reality and how the Christian must fight against it I want to explore the first book uh, the first uh, the second chapter of the book of Hebrews which we're going to be dealing with this particular subject matter here's what it says in Hebrews 2 1 through 2 which is on your handouts he says it's crucial that we keep a firm grip on what we've heard so that we don't drift off. If the old message delivered by the angels was valid and nobody got away with anything, do you think we can risk neglecting this, last, this latest message, this magnificent salvation? See, the pastor here is dealing with a drifting church. He gives them five warnings throughout the book of Hebrews, which are quintessential to regathering their faith. He warns them five times of five particular things. And it's not in your handouts, but it'll fly on the screen. The first thing he warns them is the first thing I'm talking about. He warns them not to drift. He says it right there. Y'all catch that? He says it's crucial that we keep a firm grip on what we heard so we don't what? Drift off. He warns them not to drift. The second thing he warns them is don't think actions today won't mean judgment tomorrow. 
So often we live in this willy-nilly lifestyle where we think we can just do whatever and tomorrow's harvest should never happen. But a seed sown is a seed grown. The third warning he gives them is that maturity matters, that you growing in Christ matters. You don't just get uh, happy that you got admitted into college, but you got to start studying to pass the test. You don't just get happy you got saved and now you're living for God, but you have to develop your faith daily. In other words, you can't just eat the word of God one day a week and expect to be strong. Maturity matters. The fourth thing he says, don't mix today's troubles with God's faithfulness. He says, whatever y'all going through today, do not mess it up thinking that because you're going through a tough time today that God has forgotten you. He said, don't mix it up. He says, troubles today actually is a sign God is still present. The fifth warning he gives them is that God will have the last word. That's a word for America today in Western Christianity when we're dealing with all of this misnomer and misinterpretation of what evangelicalism is. We think that because we vote a certain way, we're more righteous. We think because we have a certain candidate in office, we're more holy. But the truth of the matter is, I don't care who's in office, when God speaks, he will have the last word. And when God speaks, it will be justice and righteousness and not the person you picked. Amen. This Hebrew pastor was preaching to a group of Christians who were losing their momentum. Their mojo was fading out uh, because of outside persecution. His congregation consisted mostly of Jews because the pastor used a lot of the Old Testament to give them that Jesus is better. One theologian said that the book of Hebrews need to be titled the book of better. Yes, he goes into these various uh, analogies, giving them the Old Testament Sabbaths and festivals and Old Testament characters, even heroes of faith. And he says to them that Jesus is better than all of that. He says Jesus is greater than Moses. To an early Jew, you're like, whoa, he's better than Moses? Yeah, the Hebrew pastor said Moses pointed to Jesus. He says Jesus is greater than the Sabbath. You know, whoa, the day that God instituted as rest, which, were, which is how we tend to diminish and make God diminutive. We tend to say that Sabbath is a day. So you have whole church organizations that build their entire faith on whether you worship on Saturday or Sunday, not realizing you missed it all together. Jesus is our rest. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my yoke is easy and my burden, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is our rest. So wherever the Christian shows up, rest shows up. He becomes our Sabbath. It's not a day. See, we love to make God a day, but everywhere I go, God is. See, Jesus, he says, is greater than the greatest high priest of the Old Testament, which was Melchizedek, who gave Abraham the blessing. He says, Jesus is better than him. And he ended up saying that Jesus is greater than the sacrificial system where the priest had to go before God daily and make sacrifice for the people and constantly because of some of the sins. But it says our high priest, Jesus in Hebrews 10 and 12, but our high priest offered himself to God, not continually, but as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time, which means I don't have to keep going before God saying to him what I have been delivered from. But Jesus becomes the ultimate sacrifice and he is the, he is the sacrifice that pleased God on our sinful behalf. So the Greek word, the Greek word for drift is parayomen. It means to glide by, to glide by, to glide by. If y'all have ever flown in the jet or an airplane, you will know that it needs a motor and those motors and propellers and engines, turbines have noise to it. You know that a jet is still flying based on the noise on the outside. But a glider has something else that launches it, but it produces no sound. See, your Christianity can literally be drifting because we don't hear a sound. You ain't making no noise. See, you're just... Worship is going on in the house and you're just... Miracles are happening right next to you and you're just... You know, y'all get that dignified look. <laughs> Your house is on fire. God is the extinguisher. And you're like, marbles in your mouth, mothballs in your spirit. Just gliding by. God wants you to make some noise. Yeah, yeah. Why? <laughs> because you have not... 
because you ain't talking. And you expect God to keep answering silent prayers. But when you release the sound, I love it. You let the atmosphere know this is unacceptable until God answers. So the question is, are you gliding by? This word does only appears, parayomen only appears once in the New Testament, but the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew of the old, uses it one time. And it's found in Proverbs 3 and 21. Look what it says. My son, do not look at the word slip away. Same word, parayomen, slip away. But keep my counsel and intent. Don't let it slip away. Contextually defined, drift means to lapse into spiritual defeat describing how we slowly move away from our moorings, our banter, our speech, our spiritual righteous patriotism for Jesus Christ. Here's the dilemma. See, any speaker will tell you that in order to correctly address the audience they've been called to speak to, they need to know the audience. This pastor lets us know what he's dealing with. Check his audience out. In Hebrews 5.11, he tells us this is the audience, the congregation's problem. He says, I have a lot more to say about this, but it's hard to get it across to you since you picked up this bad habit of not listening. By this time, you ought to be teachers yourselves, yet here I find you need someone to sit down with you and go over the basics on God again. Starting from square one, baby's milk, when you should have been on solid food long ago. Milk is for beginners, inexperienced in God's ways. Solid food is for the mature who have some practice in telling right from wrong. He's dealing with the church that chose to simply be happy with the admission letter, but refused to show up to finals. He, he was talking to a church that was so happy to get the car, they forgot to take the car in for an oil change and the engine went bad on them. He was talking to a church that was so happy with getting a house, they forgot to maintain the house, and the house is no longer livable because they were just so happy with their entry, they forgot that they were called to do more, to expand, and to build, and to mature. They just got happy with being at the table. They didn't realize they had power. And so this audience was suffering from drift. What does it mean to drift? And this is where I want to poll you, and I want to come down for a second, and I want you to give me some quick-fire answers because I shot my time by 50%, which means I got to say a lot more in a short period of time. So I want you to just fire off some thoughts, and I'm going to repeat it, but what are some symptoms of drift? Like, what are some things that are characteristic of a person who is drifting? Someone talk to me. Not going to church. Not going to church. And it becomes... Justify. They don't like me. Say again, say again. It's a reason. They don't, they, they, the praise and worship whack. The people mean. Um, I don't feel like it. Sunday is my only day off. Right? I got stuff to do. Okay, I saw something over here. Say it out loud. Oh, meal prepping on Sunday. Anyway, go ahead. Uh huh. <laughs> Focusing in on the people and not on God. Yeah. Stories told of a woman who went to her pastor's office and said, I'm leaving the church because the people are mean and unkind. And so I'm leaving. And so the pastor tells her, I want you, before you leave, to get this cup of water, and I don't want you to let this water fall in church. I want you to focus so much on this water, this glass of water, don't let one ounce of it fall out of this glass. And so she applied, uh, complied, it was weird, but she complied, and she has this glass of water, and she does not let one drop of it fall. So the pastor comes to her and says, so did any water fall out? Fall out? She said, no. He said, that's the same way I want you to focus in on God. God is, the, God is a glass of water, and if you focus on him, you won't see the fallout in other people's lives. What else? Give me a couple more. Give me a couple more. What else is the symptoms? Yes, ma'am. Not reading our Bible. Well, we just let the preacher do all the preaching for us, and we crack it open only when we're in dire straits. Okay. What else? I saw a hand over here. Isolation. Well, I just don't want to be around nobody. I'm going to worship from home today. And then one day leads to five weeks, leads to five months, leads to six months, and the devil wearing us out through isolation. 
you are saved, but you are weakening your testimony because God never called us to do salvation or this journey with Christ alone. Yeah. Wonderful said. So here's some things I came up with. Senioritis. Anybody know what that is? I'm going to come back down. Senioritis. I just hit somebody and they're like, oh my God. It's that moment where you're about to graduate, but you're so tired. You're like, oh my God. I don't care about fine. I'm over it. I'm done, not another final, not another, I'm over it. And so you don't even show up. you just like, whatever. You get spiritual senioritis too. Where you feel like you have achieved a certain status or a certain stature in God that you forget. No, no, no. We go from faith to faith. And there are no graduates in the kingdom. We're constantly in the student's chair. Another one I said, lack of energy. Like, you're just kind of like lethargic. Worship is going on. God is moving. You're like, no. Praise is what I do when I want to be close to you. I live. Yeah. And then you just be like, you just be like, you know, people, people, thank you. You're like, They act like God here. He is. <laughs> right? Um, lack, intentional absenteeism. I think someone said that. Well, you just intentionally absent. You're like, no, I'm not showing up. Let me give you a couple more. Lack of volunteerism. Because when you volunteer, you're using your gifts for the kingdom of God. You back out of everything because you need me time, you need Sunday time, you need Monday time, you need Tuesday time, you need Wednesday time, you need Thursday time. You're tired when you get off work. You're tired when you go to work. You're tired when you go to church. You're tired when you leave church. You just, I ain't doing it no more. I'm tired. I know people who don't even work because they are wealthy and they get, wake up tired. You will be tired. You might as well die <laughs> working because you're going to be tired if you do nothing. All right, let me go on. Let me finish up because I got to hurry up. Uh, no spunk. Intentional ignorance of what's going on. We can, do, we can do video announcements, text message announcements, Facebook, social media. We can put it on uh, uh, Instagram, Twitter. We can put it on Tinder because that's where some of y'all go. Um, <laughs> Swipe right if it ain't right. <laughs> don't go on tonight. I ain't on that, so don't y'all be try. Don't you play. Like, he on that? No, I just know things. We, we don't pay attention to what's going on in ministry because to know it means we have to be obligated to some component of So to play ignorant means I can say to the church, y'all didn't tell me. When will we go move? I didn't come into 95. I didn't know we had bought a whole building. My God, what in the world? Y'all ain't told me this amount of nothing. I can't be a part of church that don't include me in what's going on. We didn't march around the grounds, prayed on the inside, threw all, all over the building, released the sound on the seventh trumpet, seven times. And you're like, whoa, whoa, my God, what church didn't God, what, what, what place, what? <laughs> pastor in Africa, I never heard of such a pastor being in Africa. What? When did they let him go all the way to Africa? Who? I came to hear him. I can't hear nobody but him. I got six minutes, but I'm going to ask you two more. Uh, <laughs> lack of giving. We just say, nah. I'm going to scatter whatever I do, you know, church 54% to pledge. I ain't 54% to my savings go. I don't, they don't need me. We, we opt out. We pull away. We say no one will ever notice. Guess what? You're drifting. You're just gliding by. You're not making a lot of noise. In fact, the less noise you make, 
you prove to yourself nobody cares because you want people to read your mind. You want them to look at you and say, oh, today, James Bartholomew Payne. That's not his middle name, by the way. I sense and see that you are feeling a little despondent. Could it be? Hold on. Don't say nothing. Oh, Lord, I thank you. Glory to God. I went to the prophetic summit, so I got some prophetic anointings now. Um, um, School of the Prophets has blessed me. I, I, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, this is what the Lord is saying. Oh, are you seeing stars at night? Okay, thank you. Glory to God. I, I sense that you are trying to go somewhere, but you are sleepy. Mm. One second, one second, one second. Okay, okay. Th- 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 there's a, there is an alien that, okay, that's the enemy. He's chasing you down. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You like Cheerios without milk, but God is... That's what we look for. See me. See I'm not praising and worshiping. See that I'm not happy. And then tell me all that I'm going through. And if you can't, this is not the place for me. See, my brothers and sisters, I was going to give you an analogy, but let me just give it to you real quickly. In fact, just fly it up there. If a rocket ship is one degree off going to the moon, in one mile, it will be 92, uh, 92, let me get it right. There you go, 92 feet off course. Just 92 feet. If, it, if it's one degree off course from the moon, in one mile, it'll be 92 feet off. But by the time it gets to outer space, it'll be 4,900 miles off through one degree of being off. Question is, are you in no man's land? Are you, are you just floating in the place that you know has no destination? You're drifting. Small decisions matter. Let me help you out. Let me give you four ways to stop drifting. Thank you for those two minutes. I'll get y'all out of here. I promise you, it is almost time for me to go. I'm going to give you one. Here's the one. I'll give you two. Here's the two. One, read God's word and take it seriously. It was said by one of you all, and I appreciate you. It would read God's word. Don't just get to the place where you take in the diet of the word of God once a week, but get in the place where it becomes your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. God never gives victory to people that don't have fuel for it. The word of God is fuel for it. Can I give you real quickly what it says here? He says in the Hebrews 2, 1 through 3, he says, it is crucial that we keep a firm grip on what we what? Heard. How can they hear without a preacher? How can he preach except he be sent? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the... So the enemy wants to cut off the method that God created to build your faith because you might have issues with pastors. And the enemy said, if I can keep you at odds with leadership, I can cut off your faith building exercise. So the mountain you should be speaking to, you climbing. And you don't realize you shouldn't be climbing no mountain as a Christian. You should be speaking to the mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. But you're too busy climbing. In fact, they wrote a song about it. I'm going up on the rough side of the mountain. And I'm doing my best to make it in. You shouldn't be climbing nothing. But when you cut off the method of growth, then your faith stays stale. You think that the word of God is something can be easily dismissed, not as a child of God. You, you, your spirit man cannot afford to take in every ounce of gossip weekly and not the word. He says, take a firm grip of what you heard. Don't let it slip. Before Joshua could go into the land of promise, God didn't say sharpen your sword. God didn't say sharpen your axe. God didn't say train them on drop, rock, drop uh, rock and roll. He didn't train them on some new method and military strategy. God told Joshua, this word, this law, don't let it depart out of your mouth, but meditate in it day and night. Then you shall have good success. You shall prosper and have good success. When should you take it in, uh, Joshua? Day and night. You, listen, one meal a week makes a saint week. Yeah. 
And it's not about what the church is doing. It's not about programming. If the church did more stuff, I would be there because that's the trick of religion. And that's the spirit of religion in the metropolitan St. Louis area. We got more conferences than conferences got conferences. We got a conference every week. Next thing you know, we're going to have all. See, what y'all need to understand real quickly, um, I'm in my apostolic mode where I come up and I look down and I see the region. Here's the deal. St. Louis is a circus region. We love, we love circus kind of stuff. You preaching, you preaching in a red velvet suede suit. And God said, because it's red velvet and suede, the blood of Jesus is going to wash over the house. And I got some red oil and I'm going to lay hands on red people who come in with red lipstick and drive a red car. We love, we get, oh yeah, we get excited about it. Not as egregious. We listen to false promises that give us quick fixes and we jump to these comforts. They rape us of our faith. It's a money-making scheme. We flock to it. We even let people put false labels that they're in revival, but no one is reviving. And we don't mind if it's 9,000 speakers from across the country because we're looking for all from wherever we can get it. But God ain't going to let all come from the outside. God going to raise all from the soil because God wants to crush some stuff here so oil can be produced. And the way St. Louis gets revival is when we start settling our appetite in the word of God, personal growth, quit comparing notes to who's doing what. We're not John Hanna. We're not Matthew Stevenson. Quit trying to find that here. God God is doing something unique, right? Nothing against the man of God, but I'm saying we keep trying to make somebody else us. And if they're not us, we flock to it. And God is saying, you missed it. Because what God's going to raise up is right in the house of Israel. All right, can I go on? Quickly, number two. Number two. Ah. If you're going to stop drifting, number two, and I'm done. I promise y'all I'm done. We're over. Forgive me. Um, um, uh, those in the internet world, we love you, um, but we have come to the t point of our departure and conclusion. It's been real, but deuces. Here's the deal. If you're going to stop drifting, recall the miracles of yesterday. Recall the miracles of yesterday. We call this mental rebooting or rebooting, rebooting your mental hard drive where you can go back to how God gave you what you have now. In fact, let me just share one of the more, more basic problems Christians have with God is forgetfulness. We, we tend to forget the goodness of God. We tend to forget what he's done for us, what we prayed for. And wherever there is forgetfulness, there's devaluation and entitlement. Devaluation is when you no longer have it as a priority, but you make it less in value. So you just kind of come into the presence of God like, oh, whatever, sure. He's here. Uh, uh, he was here last week too. Whatever. God be with us. Oh, amen. And then entitlement is the idea that God will always do what God has always done without us ever having to respond in kind. Wherever there's forgetfulness, there's a missed opportunity for greater blessing. Because when you devalue God, when you feel entitled, you feel there's no need to comply with the demands of the other party because he will always be there. Now, here's the deal. When you remember that you're not just somebody who popped up on the scene, got the degree, got the house, got the car, got the blessing, got the mental uh, clarity back and the emotional wholeness back. But God performed a miracle in your life. You're not here based on just happenstance, but if you look back, come on with me and go back in the time capsule. When you look back and see that it was God that brought you a mighty long way. How did you get into college with a 14 on your ACT and got a master's degree? God made a way out of no way. How are you opening up a business in the midst of a down economy in 2008? God gave you the grace and the blessing and the favor and the anointing. How is it everybody else is lacking but your belly is full of the goodness and the grace of God because God put his hand on you. Not your neighbor and say, I'm a walking miracle. I'm a walking miracle. I'm a walking miracle. I'm not what you think I am. So you got to be careful what you think about me because I'm here based on the grace of God. I'm here based on the miracle working power of God. Do I got anybody here that can say if it had not been for the Lord 
who was on my side. Oh Lord, where would I be? Do I got anybody here that can say it was God that brought me a mighty long way? Remember, recall, here's the last thing. Read this with me. I'm done. Rest stand all over the house. I'm done. I'll finish this next week. Ha! That's what the pastor says. If you're going to stop drifting, remember the reason you got launched in the air is because God put you there. You are the miracle story of God. And you need to go back to when he first got you in the place he has you right now. I need no walking right now. I need everyone aside from ushers and greeters to be in position. Because I want to just pray over you real quickly and I want to see what we're going to do and what God's going to do. But here's what I want you to read. Because I'm not going to be able to fellowship with you. I love you greatly, but I got to go. I got to go. I need you to get this though. Remember those early days after you first saw the light. The pastor says those were the hard times. Kicked around in public. Targets of every kind of abuse. Some days it was you. Other days your friends. If some friends went to prison, you stuck by them. If some enemies broke in and seized your goods, you let them go with a smile. Knowing they couldn't touch your real treasure. Nothing they did bothered you. Nothing set you back. So don't throw it all away now. You were sure of yourself then. It's still a sure thing. But you need to stick it. Stick it out. Staying with God's plan. So you'll be there for the promised completion. Can I tell y'all something? When you remember God's goodness, you reposition yourself for the promises of God. The pastor tells them, when you think about the goodness of God, you put yourself in the posture for the next miracle. He tells them in Hebrews 10 and 37, it won't be long now. I know it's been a few nights, but it won't be long now. Because he that shall come, will come. It won't be long. Hallelujah to God. It won't be long. It won't be long. What you've been asking, it won't be long. You're at the brink of it. You're at the, you're at the door. I know you're tired. I know you're weak, but it won't be long. Yes. Yes. Can we just worship because I want God to do something in the house. We're going to let y'all go, but we got to do this quickly. Here's the deal. It won't always be like this. God will perfect that concern with me sooner or later it will work in my favor it's turning around can y'all prophesy that song over your life it won't always